we'll go from here. Hopefully those will turn on when they get a chance. All right, show of hands. How many of y'all are still doing licensing work versus being licensed currently? Okay. Decent amount. I think we have four or five licensed currently in the group. You know, Austin's got his. Lonnie, you've got yours. Okay. All right. Um, for those that are unlicensed right now, I'm going to take like two or three minutes. Any challenges you're running into that you could use group help with? As far as test prep, anything else to get across that finish line? Yeah, hey, uh, I have a, a quick thing to kind of help everyone out. Um, yeah. So I started using Prep Agent recently. I don't know if anyone has uh, has hopped on that, but so far it's been able to help me out a lot um, in terms of the vocabulary. All the videos on YouTube that I've seen have said that vocabulary is one of the biggest, biggest, biggest um, things you need to learn when taking the test and that if you don't know vocabulary, you're really going to struggle. And so they help you out by having an entire worksheet of every term um, that will aid you in that process. And they have the flashcards and they have their own like little seminars that could um, help you out as well. And they're able to tailor um, like little study sessions to exactly what you need. And you take your practice tests as well. And there are some tips in there that is very helpful. So for anyone in California, um, who's going to be taking the exam, there's actually no math on that one. And that's something that prep agent tells you. So just like little tips here and there um, that will help you out. So that's been aiding me a lot while studying, which I have my exam coming up on the 27th. So if anyone needs help, they could reach out to me or check out prep agent and that's going to help out a lot. Cool. Appreciate that. Yeah, I know several people have used prep agent. Lonnie chimed in as well saying the same thing. So it's definitely helpful for folks. The other thing that I would say to you guys, um, you know, a lot of a lot of people struggle with this, I think, of trying to get over prepared for the test. Right. Everyone's worried about, hey, am I going to pass or not? If I don't pass, does this look bad? I'll, no one, for the most part, when you get into this industry is going to ask you if you pass the first time or not. Right. And most states, the the financial penalty, if you will, that you incur if you have to take it a second time is usually somewhere on the order of 100, 150 bucks. So it's normally not too huge. What I would say is study, get to a point where you feel prepped and go take it. Even if you fail, right, it gives you a good idea of what's needed the next time around. So you have real world test experience with it. Um, it's not like, you know, you're testing on the enlisted side for military, right? It's not that gravity of a test, right? So I would rather see you guys go try it earlier and fail, you know, and have to go back and take it one more time and still get it done quicker than if you go for, hey, I need to get 95 or above to know I'm 100% confident I'm going to pass the test. And now I've delayed five months in getting my license for that fear of I need to be close to perfect on the test. Um, I think the test score in most states is between 70 to 75 is the passing rate. So essentially a C, right, if you're back in college. Um so I would push that, you know, as quick as you can going through that, getting that prep done and then getting in there. Uh, yeah. And like Austin said, I, mine, when I did it in California, had some math, apparently they're taking all the math away, uh, but it didn't have many math questions. And so for me, I'm a, I'm a math guy and an engineer. So I actually like math. I was disappointed by the fact that they had very, very few math questions. Um, but they do focus, uh, Carlos, like you said, on a lot of vocab and everything else, right? Um, really at the end of the day, and this is the, the balance again for your focus within the internship, your test is on giving you a license to be able to go practice real estate. It's also basically just to make sure that you have enough knowledge, to try to stay out of committing crimes within real estate and stay out of jail, right? It is not going to teach you how to build a real estate business. That's where all the stuff that you're going to find in Skillbridge RE University you know, plays an effect, right? So the NAEA stuff, scripts, practices, all those types of things that are in there are how to actually build out the business. And then we had invited a lot of folks. Um, if you guys, for some reason, don't have the link to it, let me know. We can get it uploaded. But we did our, our business planning session with our team and also with external agents last year. Uh, you're more than welcome to go back and watch that too, right? Because we walk through mindset within that, which I think is critical in this industry, especially as you go through roller coaster up and downs. 
Uh, so we work through that. We work through numbers as well, right? How to be able to figure out how many calls you need to make to get to X number of appointments, which gets to X clients, which gets to X closings, right? To, to meet your financial needs in life. And so if you guys don't have that link, let us know, you know, just in the, the general thread um, in the Skillbridge Slack channel, and we can make sure to get that uploaded for you guys to see. Um, what I want to walk through today is basically some some changes coming for you guys in the future. I know we've been talking about some of these. We're trying to get them rolled out. They will be coming in incremental fashion for you guys uh, for different items that you'll be able to start doing here soon. Uh, so Austin can talk to this because he's already started doing it as, as a licensed intern that's on our team. Uh, but cold calling will be one of them, right? So it's, it's a skill set that you're going to need at some point in real estate, whether you make that a main pillar of what you want to do for lead generation or not. Uh, at the end of the day, if you have a lead come in, for example, off Facebook, even if you start at social media, for the most part, at some point, you're going to have to pick up that phone and talk to someone that you've never talked to on the phone before to create a relationship and build business, right? So having that skill set is going to be critical for you to be able to get over that hurdle. To me, it's much better for you guys to practice on numbers and data that's provided where there's no real consequences, right? You can't earn money in this internship anyways. Um, so your current income's not on the line. Uh, cold leads, as Austin can you know, attest to, and any of our other agents that are doing it are a very, very, very low conversion rate overall. Typically when you're talking, right, it's all a numbers game. And so you have lower risk on it too, right? It's just getting that muscle memory and picking up the phone, calling people and having your first two or three sentences that you want to say to get a conversation going in mind. And then learning how to let the asking the questions and the clients answer direct where the conversation goes instead of like, I know there's a ton of scripts out there, but scripts in my mind, when you get too deep into them and you memorize them too much, really what you're doing is you're interrogating the potential client and no one wants to be interrogated on a, on a potential sales call. Right. So being able to understand how to walk through naturally in the flow of a conversation to get the questions that you need answered to be able to properly support them without just going down the list of questions to ask, right, is a very important skill set that you'll learn doing this as well. And so we're working through the process to figure out how to get you guys access to a, a system to do that, uh, that we pay for for the team so that you guys can get in there and start doing cold calls. Uh, we're also looking to get you more shadowing opportunities for those that are around our team agents for when we have open houses, that type of stuff, so you guys can get out there and do those. I know we had some uh, with the previous group that went through. I don't think we've had as much with this group, just with less overall properties that were going on the market uh, within the team. Um, so there'll be those opportunities as well. We're also going to have you guys start doing social media posting. And so we're going to provide you some materials to post on a weekly basis. Uh, that's basically to reach out to your sphere is we're all coming from the military side to see who you know that's moving and how you can help them, right? And that's, again, a skill set that's going to serve you well throughout your career, especially if you look at serving fellow military families, uh, just to constantly be posting that type of stuff and getting into conversations with people that may be moving. And again, then start starting to walk through how you can support them throughout that process. Um, as you guys know, if you've you know done more than one tour in and you've moved, you know, moving and housing is typically the most stressful aspect of our PCS, right? Outside of if you have EFMP. And so that aspect deals with quality of life, how far away you're living from base, how long you're commuting every day, the cost. I mean, it, it factors into every aspect of your life. And so if we can ease the burden of that from our fellow military families, that's very helpful, especially as people that have gone through that walk that walk, right? We understand what that's like to be able to empathize with them and, and support them as we do that. So we're in the process of putting together some graphics. We'll get those out on the SkillBridge channel as well. There'll be guidance on how many times to post that per week. Um, basically getting through the mindset too of uh, over posting, right? I know how many of y'all think that you can post too much on Facebook or one thing? I'd, I'd love to see a response on this. Brandon, yeah, okay. Who else? Be honest. All right. Um, do y'all do y'all know the stats on Facebook's algorithm as far as like what percentage of your sphere actually sees your post on average? Anyone have it off the top of their head? It's somewhere, if I recall correctly, it's somewhere between five to ten percent of your sphere is going to see any one post, max. And so when you think about it, like you're posting a joyous occasion in life, right? If you comment on it, people start commenting on it, you write back five words or more, that does up the engagement in the Facebook algorithm. 
But even if you do that, you might have 4,000 contacts on Facebook and get 50 to 100, 200 likes, 50 comments, maybe. Not everyone's seen that post, right? I mean, Facebook is in the business of making money. They're going through, they're pushing ads, they're pushing other people's stuff, trying to connect people and trying to drive revenue, right? So you can post the same thing across Instagram, TikTok, Facebook, and do it two to three times a week. And you likely still won't hit your whole audience set that you're gunning for. And so the idea is, as you post these frequently and you can change the wording on it, right? We're going to have different graphics for you guys. But as you post these frequently, it will get out to more and more of your sphere. So you can start having those conversations. So, I mean, again, show of hands, you guys are, are looking to get your real estate license. How many of you would like to help other military families with their real estate needs? Four hands, five, okay. The rest of y'all want to do something else? Francisco, what do you want to do? So you shaking your head. You're on mute still. All right, you froze up. We can come back to you when your phone's working. So for those of you that want to support military families, I mean, this is one way to do it. If you don't want to support fellow military families, then reaching out and asking people um, whether or not they're PCSing probably is not a pillar way that you want to build your business unless you're just looking to refer those folks out to a trusted network, right? And that's still an option as well. Um, how many of you guys have gone through business planning at all for this as you're launching a business to look at what activities you need to do in order to be successful. Yeah, a few. Okay. For the rest that haven't done it, what's stopping you? Feel free to come off mute and chime in. Need participation, guys. Well, I, I can speak uh, for for some, you know, in a sense where what my hung up, hang up was when I first started is trying to be have everything planned out. You want to make sure you you have all the stuff. It's like you've said before, trying to make sure you have perfect action before you act. Um, even like right now, I'm I'm currently just waiting outside, um, getting ready to go in for uh, vendors coming in uh, for a, a house that I have under the contract. And that happened for me pretty quickly. I wasn't really ready, or at least in my mind, to have all the information, all the knowledge, but I'm learning a ton along the way. So a lot of times I will tell you guys that sometimes you you want things to be kind of right because as military folks, I know we do a lot of the crawl, walk, run type thing. So we, we do prep, we do training, we do all these things. And then we have somebody who's kind of holding our hands and for a little bit and to kind of get us out there, you know, even as even when you become a platoon leader, you still have a an NCO guiding you to kind of get you to kind of push you in the right way. But, you know, this is not one of those things where I, I would say you, you want to wait till all the preparation is done. And I know that's that can be a hindrance. Uh, but I think if, if you call on folks, there's there's people here that can help you. And there's people here that can kind of get you past those those little barriers that you have. And then we each are going to come at our own our own speed and our own process. But I, I, I will tell you, the, probably the number one mistake I would tell you to avoid is not asking for help, you know, uh, because if you wait for perfect action and, on the, and you know, because you, you want your plan to be perfect, then most likely nothing will happen. Um, I think this is this is not one of those things where uh, your failure can demise your entire career. Um, and that's that's what I would add as far as two cents. Yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. Yeah, I would say, you know, the the only way that your failure can demise your your military career or your real estate career would be if you act unethically. Right. And that's just that's something that costs you your license. And obviously the rep goes out there and that's not how I think any of you are going to go act. But I think that's the only thing. Any mistakes that you make are pretty much recoverable. Right. The biggest things would be contracts, too, for your clients. Once you guys are licensed and start writing making sure the proper protections are in place for your clients. Because once that's agreed upon, that is a no-go back, right? 
Um, for example, if you walk into to one that's not all cash, but you have no inspection, loan, or appraisal contingency, you've now set your client up to be at risk, right, for not completing that sale and losing money. Uh, but outside of that, like calling people, as long as you're following the do not call list requirements, right, and, and not calling DNC numbers, um, you know, texting people, reaching out via social media. I mean, you guys are going to do stuff imperfectly to start with, right? You get better over time. Um, one of the coaches that we follow that I've, that I've brought up here that we've done a lot of um, group coaching sessions with, if you will, at trainings is John Cheplak. And I recommend that you guys check him out on Facebook. He puts out a ton of free content that's very, very valuable. Um, the guy charges, if you get on a coaching call with him, it's two grand for a 20 minute call. So his free stuff is is well worth the money, obviously. Um, but he's been in this industry 20 plus years, coaching folks, uh, coaches, past presidents, athletes, CEOs, all that stuff, right? So you can get access to him. But you'll see his stuff too. And he just put out a post, I think it was last week, making fun of his videos that he was doing 10 years ago. And he's like, look at how crappy my videos were back then. I didn't have good lighting. I didn't have, you know, the proper hook to start with. I didn't have any of that. But what I did have was I had the execution. I was willing to go out there and do it every day. And by doing it every day, I reached an audience. I've been saying the same stuff 15 plus years. Reached that audience and got better with it over time. Got better at putting the video together, the, you know, walking around, the background, all that type of stuff. He's like, and so you can see that progression, but this is where it started, right? Again, the guy's now putting on, multi-million dollar events when he started his events he'll talk about it anytime you hear him speak he he typically talks about it um he's now colic right they had to go through recovery 20 different times literally uh before it stuck and uh his his first um event he put on i think he said he had five people show up right now he's packing rooms with 500 to a thousand people 5,000 to 10,000 more right exp quantities keynote speaker on stage so Really good guy uh, to be around. Um, just by going to EXPCOM, we've been up in you know private suite masterminds with him, right? Getting invited to that just through the connections and the people that we know, and that's through our business partners within this group. Uh, so he's again a, a good one to follow. He'll put out if you get on his mailing list, you'll get something from him via email probably every day, and you'll see that it's it's a good person to look at. If you guys have ever read, um, I think it's Tom Ferry. Uh, mindset, marketing, and modeling, I believe it was, or mindset, mirroring, and modeling. Um, so it talks about mirroring. It talks about modeling successful people though, right? So he's a good one. If you want to watch how he does things, you can take some clues from that. A lot of times he's repurposing the same content that he puts out on Instagram and Facebook. That then becomes an email. That email goes out, might become a blog post, you know, all that type of stuff. So you don't have to recreate stuff over and over as you're taking the social media approach. Um, but he's also one, if you get in the room, he's not full up drill instructor mode, but he's usually no sugar coating whatsoever. A lot of profanity laced in, a lot of getting on to people, calling people out, um, just trying to help people, right? So he's not everyone's cup of tea, as he says, right? You may or may not like him, um, but he does put out a lot of good stuff. So you'll see again, he's hitting the same thing over and over on on all the social media platforms, right? Because you can't really oversaturate it with the way that the algorithms are. So in Clark with yours, like you said, it's it's imperfect action, right? I don't know if you're still on. Um, yeah, I see your phone. So imperfect action, right? Like you don't have to know every, every single step to go out and do the first step, right? Just go do the first step. Once you do that, you'll get more confidence to start doing the next step, right? And do it imperfectly. It doesn't have to be perfect to start with. If you guys wait till everything's perfect, if that's the focus that you you take, most likely what's going to happen is you're not going to get anything put out. And if you listen to Chep like he talks about perfect being the enemy of execution and perfect being an excuse for not actually acting. So um, again, that goes back to your test. That goes back to getting licensed, walking through this program, uh, getting out on the other side and actually starting to practice real estate. So back to the military question, you know, we only had probably half hands raised for the other half that, you know, didn't identify that they wanted to help military families is one of their main pillars. Have you guys identified who your ideal clients are? What audience you want to speak to? 
anyone feel free to chime in. These are actual questions for you guys to help you work through this. David, I'm going to call on you, man, to break the ice and, and the word here. We got the same name, so help me out. Yes, sir. So um, definitely. So personally, what I'm trying to do is um, I am trying to start something to do with like federal contracting, which will kind of narrow down uh, to specifics like um, what I work on specifically, like say, for example, um, renting out warehouses to the government, trying to uh, cut down the number of people like I'm making contact with which uh, when it comes down to selling it to individuals, you have to reach out to a lot of people. But when it comes to government and federal contracting, you, you're reaching out to contractors and getting those contracts online from different government organizations. So for me, that's what I'm working towards. And um, it's kind of it's kind of different, a little bit different, but it's still the same concept and still the same thing. Thank you. Yep. So I would recommend for yours, you should definitely be checking out some of the trainings that are in EXP world for the commercial side, because that's really what you're talking about. So if you're not doing those already, check those out. They do have product specialty niches that you can go to their, uh, I think their monthly meetings, but you should be going to um, tenant rep most likely is what you're looking at to start with. So you're looking at representing the tenants unless it's government looking to acquire the buildings, but a lot of times they're on the rental side. Keep in mind that the government typically does have um, their own officers that go do the real estate side for the government itself, right? So you'd be looking at actually repping the landlords more to the government with your connections, right? Cool. Who else? We got several other folks. So I'll start walking through who I remember. Brandon, did you say military or no? What was that? Was your one of your focus areas going to be serving military families or something different? Um, yeah, if if, if I do continue in real estate, yeah, I, I would, I would like to help out military families. Okay. All right, Jacob. I'd be the same way. I would agree. So I'd like to help out military as well, and then over time move into the commercial side, but definitely start out with residential. Okay. Yeah. And what I say for both of you guys, Jacob and David, looking at commercial, um, understand commercial is typically a lot longer time frame, right? Before you're getting a deal close and getting paid. So tenant rep can be a little bit quicker, but you're still typically talking about you've got to find the right facility. You're looking at build out, negotiating those terms. Usually when you do tenant rep, you'll get paid part of the lease up front and then the other part when the tenant moves in, right? And then also if they execute renewals. So just something to keep in mind as you look to, to transfer to the commercial side, it is typically a longer lead. A lot of people on the commercial side tell you to expect anywhere from nine to 15 months before you get your first paycheck. So if you're planning on focusing purely on commercial, just plan for that when you're looking at your finances. Um, on the resi side, you can probably plan to, to close your first deal if you're putting in the work within your first three to four months. Still not instantaneous, even if you get a deal under contract on day one, most deals are typically 30 days to close before you get paid. So you're usually looking at least 30 days out, which is why we ask you guys to go through financial planning too within the, the system, right? To make sure that you're prepped, so. All right, let's see, Adina, what about you? What's your focus gonna be? Um, also military families, I'm going to Virginia, which is, I'm from there, but um, there's tons of military over there. Where are you going in Virginia? Um, Hampton Roads area. So we're looking to purchase right now in Chesapeake or Suffolk. Okay. Yeah, I think we connected you up, right? Yes. Yes. Okay, cool. Let me know if that's not working out. We got another agent we can always connect you with. But All right. Uh -huh. And we've got a team Thank agent you. serving Richmond area, just so that you know. So as you look to to come on and stuff, there's there's another agent that you can reach out to that went through the program. He's a Skillbridge grad. So okay. awesome. go for thank you. Yep. Carrie, what about you? I'm sorry, what was that? What's your what are you looking at as far as like your ideal client serving? Military family or other? Um, other. Okay. 
And what would other be? Um, I'm going to be working outside of military families. So anything non-military is fine. Okay. You just don't want to deal with military at this point? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. Understand. For a lot of us, right? I mean, we don't talk about it much, but for a lot of folks on your way out, it's not necessarily the most pleasant experience. So I don't know how many are going through that, but I know I've personally gone through it. Um, a lot of times when you're on your way out, you're no longer seen as useful or valuable. And so you have less than a stellar experience in the exit process, whether it's separating or retiring. So, all right. Kayla, what about you? I would say my audience would be um, military. I am in San Diego, so there's a okay. lot of military people here. Yeah, huge military presence down there. Absolutely. Lots of bases, 40,000 plus or so around the area. San Diego and Oceanside both have huge military presence. So cool. Madison? Um, I would say I would like to help military people. Um, I'm in Massachusetts, and the only person that I know here is my husband. Um, so I'm having a hard time trying to, like, infiltrate that market. Um, and also, I'm prior maintenance, and there's no maintenance here. So it's not like I can be, like, tell my friends, like, hey, send them my way, because there's no maintenance here. So I'm yeah, sure. struggling. Okay. Where are you at? in Massachusetts? Um, I'm in a town called Hudson. So it's like 40 minutes outside of Boston and like 30 minutes outside of Hanscom. Okay. So you have Hanscom that you can still serve. All right. Yeah. I would say I wouldn't downplay the military network still. So we, we built up our business from scratch in LA with Tasha not knowing anyone. She started at KW and they did the whole with bolt training and everything else is go call 50 people or 100 people, whatever it was that you know right in the area that you can serve. And she's like, I don't know anyone here. So she called her sister who didn't live in the area, right? Um, so very similar to your situation. We built up our business. We started with um, helping military with rentals. It's a very underserved market, right? Most people don't do it. Rentals don't pay a lot of money, um, but it's a community obviously that needs to be served. And then what often happens is your renters know that you're typically, they know that you're not getting paid much to help them, that you're doing it out of the kindness of your heart, right? And usually word spreads from that. And you'd be surprised how many prior renters either turn into buyers themselves or refer you buyers when they know people coming in because you took such good care of them at such a low dollar amount to you, just take care of them that they know that you're going to take great care of their friends and family. So okay. that's a way I'd start, but um, you're not licensed yet, correct? Um, no, I just finished my course and got my certificate. Okay. So I just so, have to apply. Yep. So when you get your license and join with us, whether it's before your internship or after internship, reach out to us and we can give you some more guidance on how to build that up because we did very similar. It was a lot of social media presence as well. But again, don't discount the military network just because your first and second order contacts may all be people that aren't going to Hanscom. You'd be surprised at how quick word spreads throughout the military about people you know, helping other military members. Uh, one of our clients in LA came to us from Hanscom from, I don't even know who told him, but basically when he was saying, I might get a PCS to LA, he got told, Hey, if you go to LA, reach out to the Gwilts, like they're the people to talk to, wrote it down in his notebook. And then he said, he contacted us, I think three years later when he finally got the PCS orders, um, had no clue who told him, you know, that I've never been to Hanscom myself, uh, not on TDY or being stationed there but somehow word reached a Hanscom probably from someone that went from LA Air Force Base to there and then it ended up reciprocating back. So your network okay. can still help you even if it's not direct. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Um, Austin, you wanna share real quick what you're, uh, what you're learning so far, what you're seeing in cold calls and any successes that you've had recently? Yes, David. So um, <clears throat> I've been cold calling calling periodically, um, not religiously every day, but it is a numbers game um, out of like, you know, the four to 500 calls that have been made in the past month. You know, I've only got like a handful of like interested, I want to say like pull the, the maybe one potential um, land listing. Um, so it is a numbers game. And, um, you know, as you're making these phone calls day to day, through time, you do build like resiliency because you will get people that'll hang up on you, cuss you out, um, 
you know, nine times out of 10, nobody even answers the phone. Nine times out of 10, it's a bad number. Um, so just be prepared for all of that. Um, to piggyback off of um, what we've been talking about as far as like assisting military families, just because you're not, well, if you're not near uh, a base, doesn't mean that you can't service military families. So what, I, what I've been doing is a lot of the recruiting stations that are local here to LA, um, you know, I've dropped off my business cards, got their contact numbers, um, even offering like a helping hand for like any class talks to help them with, you know, the recruiting numbers, because right now the Marine Corps is hurting, you know, for numbers and whatever I can do to provide value, you know, in return, maybe I'll get like, you know, a referral in the future or like help a military family that's like, you know, PCSing from like Camp Pendleton or Miramar or whatever case may be to come recruit here in LA and maybe, you know, preach the importance of utilizing the VA loan or like, you know, maybe potentially get a referral out of them. So um, the recruiting stations are a, a big thing that you can, you know, help military families with, um, but also to the reserve units that are around the local area, um, you got your I and I units, um, you know, they get BAH to go ahead and live off base. You know what I mean? Even if they're, you know, a sergeant or below, right? Um, so that'll be definitely a way to assist the military families as a PCS and outside of the military base um, if nobody's tracking that already. Yeah, cool. And how many calls do you think it took to get to that one land listing, did you say? For the, just the conversation about listing the land? Yeah, I think 300 is when I got to him. Yeah. Yeah. And then about like five or six that were interested in just seeing what their like property value would be and, you know, possibly look to sell within the year or two years from that. Right. Okay. Yeah. And as we have the property value ones come through, you know, you can run them obviously being licensed for those that weren't licensed. Once we release this out, it'll be setting appointments with us and we'll run them for them. Um, so we'll get you guys those instructions as that release is out. Uh, let's see what else. Yeah. I mean, how many folks out of that would you say cussed at you? I mean, I know I've had it happen to me, but how frequent has it been for you so far? Um, I want to say cursing. The cursing probably like out of all the calls I made, like four to 500, probably like 10 of them. Yeah. First at me. Um, and 90% of those just, you know, just hung up immediately. Right. So, yeah. Leave me, leave me the F alone drop, right? Yep. Yep. <laughs> I understand. No, I've done plenty of, of cold calling on, on my end, um, especially in the commercial space. Right. So for those looking to go commercial, as we talked about that too, cold calling will be a huge pillar for you. Right. If you're not doing cold calling on the, the commercial side, you're most likely not getting a shot at any listings at all. Um, and usually on commercial, depending upon the type of property, sort of the unwritten rule is if you're the broker that brings them the deal, you expect that they sell with you in the future if they ever sell. And if they don't, usually they fall off your list. It's nothing like residential where you have Fair Housing Act and everyone's to be treated equally and there's you know not to be any discrimination and all that type of stuff commercial is still very much wild wild west so be prepared for that um most commercial outlets are not members of nar right are not members of local associations so you're not realtors right um so it's just a different approach so be prepped for that side of it but on the commercial side if you're trying to call through a lot of it's trying to figure out how to how to trace through to the right company that owns it and then usually what you're going to find is if it's an actual company that you're calling, like I found nine times out of 10, you're getting the secretary and you got to figure out a way to get by the secretary, the gatekeeper, right? To be able to actually get time with the person that can make a decision. And so half the time or more on that, you're just going to get hung up on by the secretary, most likely. So, um, but it's just, it's exercising that action, right? Getting used to it, not taking it personally, right? It's just. I mean, you guys know how many times you get called already. For those that are not licensed yet, once you submit your application for the test, get ready for people to start calling you. So vendors, brokerages that have full-time recruiters that they pay for, all that type of stuff, you're going to be on all their roles at that point. They can all buy your data. So expect them to all start calling you to, to get you to sign up for Zillow Leads and Realtor.com and join this brokerage or that brokerage, all that type of stuff. So just be prepped for those. Um, 
the guidance that we've given everyone coming through the program too, a little off topic, but don't pay for, for any leads or any of those systems till you actually get your activities going, right? Do the stuff that you can do for free first. There's a lot of companies out there that charge, you know, for leads or lead setup or whatever that actually don't end up delivering anything to you at all. And they have no requirement to deliver to you within their contract. And so you'll pay a setup fee and then you'll never hear from them again. There's nothing you can do. So there's a ton of those companies out there. You're going to have everyone in the woodworks coming out for you for a commission that you haven't earned yet. So be ready for that aspect. Um, but yeah, so uh, cold calling will be released. We've got the uh, the graphics that will be going out. Um, we're also looking for, depending upon where you guys are at, for you guys to be able to exercise the skill set of going door knocking. So I don't know if you guys have read through, understand that from the university yet or anything like that, but it's another way to go generate leads. Usually your, your top three lead pillars that you should be choosing one of at a minimum is going to either be cold calling, door knocking, uh, or open houses, right? A lot of people don't like any of those three, but the reality is those are the three that work the best that you need to incorporate into your business at some level, at least. And then you can layer on other stuff. Like I know a big thing now is YouTube, right? People want to do YouTube, TikTok, all that type of stuff. And those can work great, but they're usually longer leads until you start building your business. So if you want to build your business quicker, it's more getting out there. Uh, a lot of this is relationship-based too, right? So it's completely like the military, we have a relationship-based somewhat, but really you've got a task to do. You get assigned a task, you get provided the tools to go do it. You're not for profit. You know, your salary does not depend on how good you do, right? For the most part, when we get promotions, it's a few thousand bucks and it's, you know, not every year. Um, and so your salary is not fully dependent on what you do, right? In this industry, your salary is what you earn is completely dependent upon your actions and the success of those actions. So it requires getting out there, getting out of your comfort zone, you know, doing things that are proven to work um, and building those relationships to create the transactions that you want. Um, Austin, I don't know if you want to provide any tips for what you're doing as a newer agent. I know like Janetta, one of our, our grads as well that started seeing traction everywhere she goes. She's talking to people about real estate and when she's going to like her daughter's games and stuff. She's typically at her daughter's games, but also working on contracts and other things. And her laptop has on it, right? The logos for the team, for brokerage, you know, hey, I'm a realtor, ask me a question, all that type of stuff. Just start, you know, start conversations. So same approach for you. Yeah. Um, pretty much everywhere you go, just, you know, I always have my business cards on, on hand. Uh, uh, so I got my last promotion on my way out joining the reserves. And, you know, I drove back to Pendleton for that. And I made sure 100% to bring my business card so that, you know, everybody who showed up, you know, just give everybody a business card, let them know that I'm an established realtor in LA. Um, if anybody's looking to relocate there or since I'm part of a team, you know, we're um, across nationwide, you know, if I can't help them here, you know, I can always refer them out to a different state or, or whatever the case may be. So um, always talking about how you're in the real estate field, um, what you can do, do to provide value. And you'd be surprised on how many um, service members do not know anything about the VA loan. Um, yep. And, you know, you can serve as that subject matter expert. So, you know, answer any any questions that they have so yeah yeah and we have a fantastic lender i think he's in seven states at this point and continuing to expand so if you guys need connections for a va lender we can connect you up with him especially as you get licensed and you have clients looking to get questions answered uh, but yeah that va expertise is critical and most people don't know about the va loan benefits how to use them how they're eligible. There's a lot of misconceptions out there such as, oh, I used it once. I'm only allowed to use it once my whole life. Um, or I didn't retire. I separated. Therefore, I'm not eligible to use it anymore. That's a common one that we hear from vets, especially uh, vets that are a little older. right? Or I can only have one VA loan at a time. Yep. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you can have secondary benefits, right? And I don't know if you've, I'm assuming you know how to do it, Lonnie, but the general calculation for, you know, what their approximate secondary benefit might be, it's important to understand that a little bit, or at least have a lender that you can connect them to, right? They can run those uh, because those questions come up all the time, right? Especially if they've bought a house and now they're looking, do I rent it out when I leave or do I need to sell it? 
knowing how much they can afford at the next place with zero down, how much they'd be approved up to is, is a critical component of that, you know, analysis for them to do. So Lonnie, are you guys going on base at all to talk to folks? I know getting on base is really difficult at most locations, but. Honestly, um, with, like you mentioned a little bit ago, um, I try, I have been trying to avoid the base as much as I can since, yep. since I, uh, departed the fix at the end of January, um, high visits more than I do. Okay. Um, on that note, uh, just on the prior topic for me, I will help military buyers, but my focus is 100% on listings. Um, I've just found VA loan purchasing process to be far more frustrating than someone who's got a conventional loan. Um, gotcha. Conventional loans just offers get accepted easier. Yeah. And that's, so let's talk about that for a minute. I think that's an important topic, right? For the whole group because not Sorry, even just you being, derail you. No, you're good. You're good. Not even for you guys just being realtors, but for you guys, if you want to use your VA loan to buy your own house, right? So there's a lot of misconceptions out there within the real estate space that VA is incredibly difficult to actually get over the finish line on. And because of that, you get a lot of listing agents that have taken the listing and are the trusted advisor for the seller, right? Filling that role that tell their sellers, you don't want to go after a, a VA buyer because X, Y, Z, right? And it puts our military members at a disadvantage. Now, there is some truth to the fact that back in like the 70s and 80s and maybe even in the early 90s, VA loans had a little bit stricter um, inspection requirements and also stuff that was being called out on appraisals, right? So it, it could be at that point in time, a little tougher to close on a VA deal. In today's day and age, that like the inspection is hired out by the buyer. It's not a VA inspection. A lot of people call them VA inspections. There is no VA inspection. They don't exist. It's a buyer's inspection using a VA loan for the buyer only. And in fact, the inspection with the exception of the termite report should never go to the lender. Lenders don't want to see it. They don't need to see it. And once they see it, they have to send it to their underwriters. And now questions pop up, right? And so it is not a VA inspection. Do not send those to the lender. For states that require termite clearance, you will need to get a termite inspection that will get sent to the lender, whether or not it's clear or not, because the lender needs a clear termite to be able to close. Some states, they need both section one and two. Some states, they only need section one termite. Um, those are things that termite companies in your area or VA lenders in your area can answer for you, um, but they will need to see that, right? And so those get called out. But really, the only thing that typically has to be fixed prior to closing mandatory for the lender is if the appraiser, when they come through the house, calls anything out. And so you can have appraisal conditions, but you can have appraisal conditions for FHA loans too. Um, typically not for conventional, right? You're not seeing stuff on the conventional side. Um, but the appraisal conditions are usually, so the main things VA is looking for is usable remaining roof life, a heating source in the house, floor coverings throughout the whole home. So you can't have, you know, just bare concrete, that type of stuff. Um, they are looking for safety hazards such as significant cracks that would cause people to trip, all those types of things. Uh, termite again, but the appraiser's not really looking for termite, so they wouldn't call that out. Um, and so those those are going to be your main things that they're going to look at. Uh, usually, I would say out of all the VA transactions that we've done, maybe 2% max have had something called out on the appraisal. Everything else is VA appraised value, no conditions. Um, what I will say on the flip side, Lonnie, that I think it's important for, and you know this already, but for the rest of the group, I think it's important for the listing agents to understand when we talk through them, they've got that old mindset of VA loans are tougher to get across the finish line. Um, one, there are statistics put out by the mortgage industry. VA loans, when they go under contract, close at a high, actually successfully close at a higher rate than conventional and FHA. So that's just a fact. Um, so if we get into contract, you're more likely to get across the finish line. Um, second aspect is if your appraisal comes in low, which can happen on VA, FHA, conventional, anything. If your appraisal comes in low, VA, you actually get another shot at it. Conventional, you don't. And so the VA process is called Tidewater. They have to let the listing agent know and the lender know that the, the property is going to come in light on value. So it's going to come in under value. They're required to give a 72-hour notice before they post the appraisal to the, the VA portal. 
And that gives the lender and the listing agent an opportunity to also reach out to the buyer's agent for you guys to pull together comps that you believe support the value, provide that back to the appraiser, and hopefully for the appraiser to reconsider the value that they've come up with, right? So we at least get that shot. Then if they still don't come up the value, if the appraiser has actually busted the VA appraisal guidelines, you can either have the lender overturn the notice of value, which we've had happen, or the lender can go back to the VA regional center through a re reconsideration of value matrix, which we've done, and have the VA's uh, appraisal value overturned, right? So like we had one that was just egregious. He was $180,000 low using three-year-old comps in a very hot market. Um, and the VA basically told him, you can either update your appraisal to reflect and, and fit within our guidelines, or you can lose your VA appraisal certification. Those are your options. And he updated it. Magically, we got that deal closed, even though it was $180,000 low to start with, right? And the vet was super happy because they were getting essentially uh, four convenience evicted from their property that the owner was going to move back in and then was going to sell the place. So they they had to move out within 30 days from their rental. Uh, but you do have that option. You don't have that unconventional. So it is a strength of the VA loan. Uh, but again, depending upon your lender too, Lonnie, like it can be more difficult depending upon who you have on the lending side too. Um, so for me, at least both me and Kai, just it, not necessarily getting closed, but getting offers accepted because of that old mindset. Yeah. Um, at least just what we've seen here, the little bit we've been here, is if someone's offering the same exact amount of money and there's VA with zero down and conventional with 20 or 30 percent. Right. They're going with, they're going with, they're going with who's offering cash. Yeah. No. And, and that's. It's a tough idea from it's the seller. It's almost impossible to get around. Right. And it's a tough idea from the sellers too, because at the end of the day, the money that shows up is all green, whether it's coming from the buyer or the lender, right? They're yep. getting the same amount of money. What I like to walk them through when we get in that scenario, and it depends on what the, the buyer's finances are, because some military buyers, right, they have the finances to be able to put money down. They just don't want to if they don't have to, because they have the right to use a VA loan at zero down. And so... I will have them throw everything they have for their financing portion of the package. So I want to see TSPs, 401ks, bank accounts, you know, trust account if they have anything and everything, right? And we put that whole piece together. And then we always, on our offers at least, best practice that we've seen, we do an agent to agent cover letter, right? That then also gets presented to the seller. And so that's our way to communicate to both the agent, but also have the seller see it because it's part of the offer package that has to be presented, right? And so in that, we'll identify, okay, with our main lender, for example, we've done 60 deals with him for 50 million bucks. So that goes in there. This proven team has closed 60 deals together, right? Worth 50 million. So you know that you're going to get across the finish line if you accept our client's offer. Then on top of that, our client has X amount in financing as reserves. So if the appraisal comes in light, or if there's not significant repairs to be made, they're not health and safety, but they're just minor items our buyer can cover those, right? They're not coming in at zero down because they have zero money to do anything. They're coming in at zero down because that's the right they earn by putting their lives on the line, serving our country, right? And so we'll go that route too. Like when when we've had agents come back at us and, oh, why should my seller accept zero down? You know, I've got a 10% down offer, 20%. Like who's your client think they are that they can offer zero down? I'm like, well, I mean, our client did serve for yours and my freedom. So, I mean, really their down payment on this was them risking their lives for us. Can you accept that that's probably worth a little more money than what the buyers want to put down, given that the seller will accept is getting the same amount of money at the end of the day, right? And they're like, oh, I didn't think about it that way. So sometimes it just takes breaking them out of that mindset. There is, especially from the people that have been doing this 10, 15, 20 years, there is that, you know, set in their ways mindset of, oh, VA is not as good. Go conventional if you can, right? There's a lot of that on the FHA side too. Oh, FHA is not great. It's three and a half percent. You got all these other issues. It's another government loan program. It works well. It helps people get into homes. A lot of times the people that are doing FHA homes are more willing to overlook issues that people doing conventional with money might otherwise walk away from, right? Because they want the house. They want to get their foot in the door. They want that stepping stone, right? So they're willing to be like, okay, there's two grand worth of repairs in the house. I don't care. I'll deal with it afterwards. Your conventional might demand, oh, I need that 2000 fixed. And if the seller doesn't budge and the agents don't chip in, now the deal's blown up, right? Cash buyers, by the way, for you guys out there that are thinking cash buyers are going to be the fantastic end all be all, I'll just go that route because I have no loan and no appraisal contingency. Cash buyers tend to be the most demanding buyers in existence. 
And the reason is they have a lot of money. They're throwing it around. They they feel as though power comes with that money. They should be served up something on a silver platter, right? And we are trying to serve them. I get it. But they have a different viewpoint on stuff. And, and to that point, we've got a deal in contract right now, $1.95 million for one of our team agents, all cash buyer. And the clients were thinking about walking over, away from the deal because a few of the recessed lights were burnt out. And they felt as though that might indicate that the seller is hiding bigger issues in the house. So every approach comes with its own challenges is what I'm trying to get at, right? The skill set that you're going to learn throughout this is learning how to navigate those challenges and learning how to properly speak to your audience. And that changes a lot of times, depending upon the type of loan that they are and the client that they are, what needs you need to fulfill. If you're on the commercial side, almost everything's going to deal with, for the most part, no emotions, numbers. Show me properties that cash flow or make me money. For the vast majority of it, that's all those clients care about. On the residential side, you can talk to people about how buying this home may make them $200,000 five years down the road. And for half the people, it goes over their head and they don't care. They just want to know, is it going to be stressful paying their monthly mortgage payment? And is it in the area they want or whatever other needs that they have, right? So it's a lot of emotional side versus the commercial being a lot of just logical numbers side. So I'd recommend thinking about that too, as you decide which type of client you want to serve. But And you can do both, by the way, at eXp. So you can do some commercial while being a resi agent on eXp residential, eXp realty. You can do some residential being on the commercial side with eXp commercial. So you do have those options. It used to be somewhat walled off and they changed that rule with NEXP about a year ago. So, cool. We got four minutes left. I want to open up to you guys. If you got any questions about what we talked about, the cold calling, social media, all that type of stuff that'll be rolled out. Like I said, it will be phased. So you'll see something drop. And then a week or two later, you may see something else drop as we get stuff completed and ready for you guys. But what questions do you guys have? I got a question, David. Go for it. So comparing an unlicensed um, cold caller versus a licensed cold caller, what are the unlicensed restricted yep. to, to do? So for the most part, it's going to be you can't talk price terms. You're not going to go look up comps for the individuals. Um, you cannot talk to them specifically about you selling their property or you helping them buy a property, right? Because you're not licensed and you're not authorized to do so. What you will be doing is you'll be calling them to say, hey, I work for a company that XYZ, right? Or my team lead XYZ, right? Has done this amount over this period of time, would love to help you, that type of thing. And the goal for you guys is to get into conversations. If you get a conversation that's fruitful and goes anywhere, you're going to have a link to mine and Tasha's Calendly. So you can set up an appointment with us and with the client on the spot. You'll be able to see what our availability is, all that type of stuff. You can set up the appointment if you so desire. We can always set it up where you can be a fly on the wall for that call, right? Um, so you could you could be on that as listen only mode, right? Um, we'd have to notify the client of that, but you could be on there to listen. So, you know, there's those types of opportunities, but really the idea with the cold calling is get you guys to get that muscle moving, to see what it feels like, to build up the thicker skin a little bit, right? When your current income's not depending upon it, so that when you get to the point where you need it for income that you're a little more set up to be able to do that. So, but yeah, there are certain things that you can't say is unlicensed. I mean, I've told this story before, but really the reason I went off and got my real estate license back in 2017 was doing open houses with Tasha in California. And people would walk in and, you know, I'm greeting them and, hey, you know, my wife's over there. She's the realtor. Uh, any questions you have about the house? Yeah, what's the price? Let me get the flyer for you. Or Tasha, can you answer? Because I couldn't in California quote price. Right. So I'm sitting there feeling like a dummy because I know all the facts and figures about the entire house, but I can't quote price and terms because I'm not a licensed agent and I don't want to go over that line. Right. And risk anything. So um, because I was going to so many open houses with her and stuff, I went off and got my license so I could actually start talking to people. But yeah, there are restrictions and it is state dependent on what you can or can't do. So I do recommend that before you start doing the calls, like read up on your state regulations on what you cannot do as a licensed individual. Uh, so that you're not stepping over that line because it is going to be different for everyone. Good question. What else? No other questions from folks? You guys are ready to cold call? I 
Dina, any questions? Janessa? Andrew? Um, not related to cold calling, but um, or what you have mentioned, but do you, do you have a team in Virginia or? Um, we okay. Do. Yep, we okay. just launched it. When did Chris come on? Chris came on in the last month. So he's a okay. prior Skillbridge grad and decided to join the team afterwards. So we've launched in Virginia. We're in six states now and continue to expand. So, okay. Yep, absolutely. So if you want to chat about that, we can have that chat too. Cool. What else? Yeah, one more minute and then we'll drop off. We respect everyone's time. Clark, you want to chime in? You're coming back from a property. How'd it go? Don't wreck while you're driving. Uh, it, it went well. So um, one of the things that came back on the inspection was the safety of the panel, the electric panel. And okay. so because that's in there, what I did was uh, try to get two two three quotes to come out there to give us a price on what what uh it would cost to kind of get it fixed so that way when i present that to the seller and say okay this is what it's going to cost to get it fixed based on the contract here's what it is and then we kind of go from there uh so they know that i'm just not just giving my opinion um there were some other things that came back but they're really not things that i think um we can like probably negotiate because uh, at the price point that we're at, we're fairly low. So, okay. I'm much more because it's about going to cost about two thousand uh, dollars to address. But other than that, um, got a real good report. It's a nice older couple uh, that that is on the seller side, and they're very friendly, and so very very with uh, coming into property like that so it's been very really good but but it's uh definitely busy i am extremely busy running running down things and and i i, I see now why a lot of people prefer to list and, and buy <laughs> but, but i i'm enjoying it though i'm I'm definitely still enjoying it i you know and, and it's a little personal for me because my client is my my little brother so yeah um just want to make sure and then and at the same time learn so it's it's been uh, it's been exciting. Awesome. Well, you know, I'll reach out if you had questions. We've been watching over it. So I know that contract happened a lot quicker than you expected. Yeah, I I did not um I didn't expect to uh I thought it was gonna go back and forth, but I I will say um doing what I did I did verbally what you kind of described doing on paper. I I went in there. I talked about it. Um, and I spoke to to the agent ahead of time, and I kind of won her over with, uh, with with the conversation. And she she seemed really really into getting the sale. And the house had only been on the market uh, ten days. Um, and um, and then we just we just talked, and we I, I kind of used some of the things that I saw on on EXP that talks about you know finding pain points, also trying to find the win win, and and. And what I have found so far is just being transparent, being transparent with folks, um, you know, not into the point where I'm I'm putting all my cards on the table, but at the same time, letting them know that they can trust me and build that rapport. And then once you build that rapport, then it just uh, agents get like talkative and then they start telling you stuff and they start expressing things to you. And then um, you guys can kind of work through those things. And, and we were able to work through those things over the phone. And so by the time I sent my offer over, it pretty much was accepted within four or five hours. And um, and then we went from there. Um, but since then, we just, uh, just you know, making sure we get the appraisal. The appraisal got, got done and the inspection got done the next day. So, you know, getting that back, and kind of re reading through that report, finalizing those things. And then, um, yeah, it's it's just been been busy since then. I've just been running. And then I, I, have, I have a second client. And I did all all day doing showing, so it it now it really gets into the time management aspect of trying to do you know you you got um, um, my second contract as far as a buying agreement, and so now you you have to owe them some of your time to make sure that you're showing them and, and fit their schedule uh, yeah. because uh, 
because they, they're, they're not always available when when you want them to be available. So you kind of kind of work around their schedule. So now it's now I'm pinging between two clients uh, trying to get things done. But it's uh, it's been pretty cool. It's been um, it's been really good. I've definitely enjoyed it. And, and anybody has any any questions or anything, you know, feel free to, to reach out. And then, you know, I, I always reach out to David and Tasha. Uh, if I have any significant questions or if I'm if I'm doing something or like you send your send your contract. So they, they looked over the contract for me and make sure I got everything that I'm supposed to have in there. And then, you know, you just kind of go from there. Uh, but it's uh, if if you want to talk to me and ask me any questions, I, I'll tell you everything from the rookie standpoint and then, uh, then kind of pass you back on to the professionals. <laughs> Yeah, like you said, I mean, so last couple notes for you guys. I mean, this is hugely a relationship business, right? This is where relationships play a big, big factor. And so, like, we recently had an offer accepted from one of our um, one of our team agents that was competing against other offers. And when the agent got back to her, she's like, "Hey, you know, we're we're going to accept your client's offer." By the way, tell David and Tasha I said hi. I look forward to working with you guys because Tasha used to be that that agent's mentor at EXP. You know, and so that relationship still there and definitely helped along the way. And then what you just said, Clark, is a big piece of it. A lot of agents, unfortunately, they look at it as opposing sides, right? And you are to an extent, you're protecting your own client's interests, right? Uh, but at the same time, you all have a common goal. And that common goal is your client wants to, if you're represented by buyer, they want to buy, you want to help them buy. Listing agent wants to sell the house, the seller wants to sell the house, right? You're all trying to get across the same finish line. But unfortunately, what you'll see in some deals is you'll see an agent on one side of the deal or the other, either gets ego into play or anything else, and they start getting combative. And it's almost as though they don't want the deal to successfully close with the way that they act. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. And so, I had I had I had a deal like that where my my uh my brother fell in love with a with a property. We talked to the client, uh talked to the agent, the seller was not budging, but the conversation went over so well, she prayed for me and wished me well after, <laughs> which I thought was crazy. So it's yep. it's about relationships. It's about how you talk to people. It's about how you treat people. It's about how you connect with folks. Um, and if if you're okay with that, you're okay with being vulnerable and okay with talking to people, okay being honest, okay with connecting with folks, It whether the deal goes through or not, you end up building, building allies and building people that, you know, are not going to treat you so confrontational. Um, is it like that all the time? Absolutely not. Um, but so far, uh, I've reached out to at least 10 or plus agents and the conversations that even even the, I think one of them that started off confrontational ended off well by the time I just stayed calm, kept talking to her. And then it's just like it turned into a friendly conversation. So it's, it's, it's a people business for sure. Awesome. Cool. Well, appreciate the inputs, man. Appreciate all you guys chiming in and, and for attending. Look forward to, to chatting with you guys again soon. Again, we'll have stuff rolling out as it's ready. You'll see it posted within the Skillbridge channel. Um, if you got questions on it, reach out to uh, Conrad Zor or myself on there, especially for the the cold calling stuff. It'll probably be myself or uh, Zor providing the guidance um, from the license agent perspective. And then you'll have access to our calendars to book those appointments. If you do get a, people that want to have conversations, and uh, we'll start, you know, watching and seeing how that's going for you guys and then circle back as you guys start doing the activities, right? Again, imperfect action and talk about what else you could do to refine lessons, learns, you know, challenges that you're facing, all that type of stuff. But you're not going to know what those are until you actually start making those calls. So my recommendation when that gets released, um, again, as part of the requirement of the Skillbridge program, we'll be making calls to get you guys out of your comfort zone. So it's really just Look at your couple sentences. If you don't want to memorize it, that's fine. Have it up in front of you, right on a document or print it out and just start making calls through the system and trying to have those conversations. Literally, all you have to do to start is dial the number. Um, like Austin was saying earlier, 90 plus percent of your folks probably won't even pick up. So it becomes a numbers game just to get the opportunities to have conversations. And then once the people pick up, literally, you're just trying to get at least two sentences out to start a conversation. Right. And it'll go from there. You'll either have a conversation with the person or they'll be so mad from getting too many people calling them, they'll hang up. And that's fine too. Right. But it's getting that muscle memory. It's doing the activity. It's honestly somewhat getting used to getting hung up on. I don't think there's a lot of folks here working in the military that are used to making a call to a fellow military person and have them hang up on you because they're mad. Right. Or don't call me and slam the phone down. 
That's just not how we act in the military. So it is something brand new to get used to, which is why we're having you guys do this to get that sort of hurdle out of the way, get you guys a little uncomfortable, build the new skill set, and then we can build some skills on top of that. So till the next call, look forward to seeing you guys then, but appreciate everyone. Have a great day.